Uh, so my objectives during uh, the 25 minutes uh, given for me. Uh, first thing uh, to explain about why we create a new uh, architecture pattern and then go through how we created it and then again dig in deep into uh, the cell-based architecture and uh, give you some um, uh, data points that you can go and read the specification and apply it in your day-to-day uh, -day work. So how many architects in the room, like not the title as architect, but playing the uh, role as an architect? Okay, nice. So I usually get invited to different architecture conferences to give this talk. Uh, by looking at the title, a lot of people come uh, to the room, but they give kind of this look to me uh, because um, uh, whether this guy is smoking. Uh, because uh, the, the uh, thing is, a lot of uh, uh, architects are using microservices architecture these days, and then uh, they are using cloud native architecture patterns. So people think uh, uh, they can uh, cover almost everything using these existing patterns, so why we uh, need a new architecture pattern. But uh, we were not smoking, uh, so we had like really a good uh, set of uh, reasons uh, and the motivation behind uh, creating the uh, new architecture pattern. Uh, the first thing was we identified there's a mismatch. Okay, architects looking at uh, something, uh, looking for something, but uh, existing architecture patterns are not exactly addressing uh, their requirements. So that was the first motivation. And then the, as Paul mentioned, most of the uh, architecture patterns and the systems implemented using those are centralized and um, uh, it's layered. Uh, so as Paul mentioned, layers creating gates and then reducing the efficiency of development teams. So this was the first motivation that we had. Even people operate in a very agile uh, mode and uh, applying all the agile principles, architecture is blocking them being productive. So that was our first motivation. Then the second thing, uh, when you talk to architects, they draw kind of uh, really nice diagrams. I call them as PowerPoint architects. Like if you look at this diagram, everything is uh, well aligned, modern, and uh, looks really great. But if you uh, go and look at the data centers and the uh, applications that you have implemented, it looks like this, because uh, we purchased many systems during last decades, and then we have a lot of data that we can't ignore. Uh, so uh, the, this is the reality. So we need to uh, find a way how we can reuse this existing stuff and then bring new um, technology and uh, new patterns into our system. So that was our second motivation. So basically, um, uh, we need to deal with both edges, like the legacy, uh, or we call them as the brownfield. And then we need to bring the new stuff like microservices, cloud native stuff into the green field. But uh, if you look at uh, the reality, we are more into this side and then slowly uh, bringing the stuff. So the architecture pattern that we are planning to introduce should be able to handle both was one of our motivations that we had. Then the, uh, uh, while we were doing this research, we identify most of the reference architectures are not reference architectures as such. Why I claim like that? Uh, because those architecture patterns were uh, defined based on a specific technology. Uh, and not only a specific technology, even they, it is specific for a specific vendor. That how you define a solution based on this particular technology from this particular vendor and it was uh, very uh, vendor centric. So we thought uh, a reference architecture should be completely vendor neutral as well as completely technology neutral based on the technology that you want to use, based on the vendor that you want to uh, uh, get um, uh, uh, partner with, uh, that you should be able to implement it. So that was another reason or a motivation that we had to make the architecture completely vendor and technology neutral. Then the, uh, the next thing uh, we identified as uh, Samina introduced me like I usually work with a lot of customers. And when we walk into these uh, enterprises, we hear that, okay, I have a Kubernetes cluster or I have a Kafka message broker running, but I can't use those technologies with my existing architecture because uh, there are a lot of limitations in these architecture patterns that they can't utilize the uh, technology. So that's another thing that we thought we should address. 
then there is a massive gap between the architecture development and the deployment. Uh, architect will architect something, a developer will develop something slightly different to that and then a deployment engineer or a DevOps engineer will deploy something completely different because there is no such common thing that you can take from the architecture into development and into deployment. So our, uh, the, uh, the next motivation that we had, we should come up with something that you can link these three uh, personas. And then again, if you look at uh, especially, uh, this is happening in uh, North America, that uh, the developer, uh, the role of the developer is changing. Now the people call it as a full stack developer that uh, contains uh, architecture capabilities, development capabilities, as well as deployment capabilities because you design, you develop, and you run uh, these things for most of the organization. So uh, we thought of that we should link these three things and make all uh, these uh, three uh, uh, roles more productive. Then the uh, thing that uh, Paul highlighted with Uber, that uh, with microservices and this decentralization, there's a lot of uh, distributed runtimes running. So you need some kind of uh, dependency management as well as lightweight governance around the microservices uh, to manage these things as well as make uh, everybody productive, not only a single team who's developing a set of microservices. Then those were the, uh, uh, the motivation that we had uh, when uh, coming up with this pattern. Uh, but before jumping into uh, the, uh, the architecture, let's take a look at what we were using for a while. So if you look at this is kind of a timeline that we started with monolithical applications, that everything was together, that uh, user interfaces, business logic, and data. And I think uh, around 80s, uh, data technologies got really improved with uh, different database vendors. So the uh, 2T architecture came by moving the user interface and business logic into a different layer. Then the most interesting era came in 90s that um, the, it uh, went into three layers the user interface, business logic, and data. Uh, the 3T architecture uh, introduced many other sub-patterns. One favorite or uh, popular thing called MVC, Model View Controller, that uh, uh, brought middleware into the picture that how you can have a messaging layer in between the UI and uh, the back end. So even I started my career uh, during this time. And MVC uh, came up with some sub-patterns like MVC2 so and so forth. Then uh, the service-oriented era came that uh, during the service oriented era, we wrapped all the business logic around services and APIs, the same pattern by, by bringing a new layer and then it moved into microservices. So what I want to highlight, uh, most of the patterns were uh, layered and then uh, moved to more kind of a segmented uh, approach with uh, microservices came into the picture. Then this was one uh, uh, layered architecture diagram. Actually, Paul and I introduced this thing in 2012, I believe. Uh, so if you look at most of the layered architecture um, uh, patterns are single dimensional. What we did, we made it two dimensional by bringing the quality of services as well as the application lifecycle into the picture. So you get all the um, layers based on the uh, concept called system of systems. And then you get this uh, quality of services and uh, the uh, layers, uh, I mean uh, the uh, uh, application lifecycle stages in another layer. So this was a very interesting diagram that we had a lot of uh, interesting discussions and a lot of uh, uh, WSO2 customers and users uh, refer this architecture and build systems. Still, we are using this system as a um, uh, reference architecture. So uh, it was a successful story, but uh, in uh, 20, uh, 12 or 2013, we uh, experienced this uh, uh, thing. Uh, one of our customers who's based in, uh, based in Seattle, uh, they were using agile principles and it was around, I think, uh, 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 50 to 60 man uh, sub teams that they were practicing agile principles, but uh, they went into production after three years. In that particular system, we had around 100 APIs, 60 message flows, and a number of databases. Uh, so they were looking for multi-tenancy from day one, and they went into production with three active tenants. But um, uh, once the product, uh, the, the system went into production after three years, it was not that useful for the business because, uh, uh, as you know, the business requirements were changed. Then we were kind of very curious. Now, they were using agile principles, but 
uh, went into production after three years, what was the issue? Issue was uh, the architecture was not agile enough. They were uh, doing agile principles, but architecture was not agile uh, enough for them to do quick releases and uh, provide something into the business. So this was an eye opener for us. Then we thought this layered architecture is not supportive. We knew to come up with something that um, how we can make a, a agile team more productive and they can stick to uh, agile principles. So that was the start um, of this particular exercise. Then same time microservices came into the picture as well around 2011-2012. So um, we uh, had a detailed look, okay, how uh, the theory and the concepts behind microservices and uh, we were carefully looking at people who's building systems using microservices. Then one thing we noticed a common pattern uh, between the um, early adopters of microservices architecture. So Netflix, it's one example, they started writing microservices but they put a layer on top of their microservices and they call it as APIs. Then Uber, they call uh, that particular layer as edge gateway, but again, set of APIs. And eBay, uh, they use this uh, pattern called API facade. They have all the microservices and top of that, they have a uh, edge uh, API layer. Even Gartner, they introduced this concept called a mini service that you have the microservices and top of that, you have composite services called mini services. So what happened, even people uh, trying to move into more kind of a decentralized architecture, they ended up with the same layered architecture by having microservices as a another layer in the same architecture pattern. Because uh, the, everybody wants to reuse some of the existing components like um, the development tools and then uh, data and services that they wrote. So uh, the architecture looked like this. Uh, even we call it as a microservices architecture, it was uh, uh, connected with the layered concepts that uh, we were using. And one thing we noticed, uh, some of our customers who uh, move with uh, the uh, uh, microservices concepts, they uh, move in, moved into a, a little different approach, uh, basically had uh, different uh, private uh, deployments within the same layered architecture. It can be a tenant or a specific uh, uh, um, uh, area that provided based on the security. So we call it as a segmented architecture. So it was a better approach because everything is centralized, but you have the control over a certain set of layers. So especially the microservices and then integration uh, went into that particular layer and people started managing their own um, islands. And some of the uh, uh, customers uh, used a different approach that the entire platform duplicated um, into uh, uh, based on the business units. I think Alex uh, from uh, TFL, uh, might, this might be a very familiar diagram for you. So some of the customers use that pattern. Again, a segmented approach. We call it as platform of platforms. Each and every business unit, they got their own deployment and then uh, they manage it, but then again, it was a layered architecture as well. So uh, things were moving more into a segmented uh, approach, but the layering was there uh, even during this approach as well. So we kind of hit a dead end. Now, we want to move into a more decentralized approach and then make the uh, agile teams more productive, but this layered architecture is uh, blocking us and then we thought we need to have a fresh look and then have a totally different approach. So that was the uh, beginning of this exercise that was February 2018. We thought okay we need to start uh, a new project. So uh, I'll tell how we did this exercise uh, before we jump into the architecture. So the first thing we did, um, is this guy familiar? Okay, so Sir Alex Ferguson, the moral of the story, uh, the coaches kind of build people, uh, good players as well as they help to uh, be, uh, win championships. So uh, as the first thing of this exercise, I got a coach as well. So this is my coach, uh, Paul, my boss. Uh, so uh, I started working with Paul and then what we did as usual, we did a lot of research, like read a lot of research papers published by different um, academics as well as our competitors so and so forth. Then we change our reading pattern and read a lot of books. And Paul is based in London, I'm based in San Francisco, so we did a lot of uh, trips back and forth. 
uh, whiteboard sessions. But most important thing we did, we talked to our customers. So we talked to our customers and identify what exactly they were trying to do and what are the blockers that they have in their architecture. So uh, we did this exercise for a while. And then uh, we uh, narrowed down our research into a bunch of things. So as Paul mentioned, the biology, microbiology was some of the uh, key areas, so uh, interesting areas that we had. And then again, we focused on the quantum computing a bit, as well as they have a really good concept came with Kubernetes. We focused on that as well. Then another thing that we did while we were talking to our customers, we identified there is a misalignment with the business uh, expectation versus technical uh, ex uh, implementations in the services. Uh, so if you look at a service, uh, in general, it's just a set of code, right? Like you just write some set of codes and then you um, uh, annotate it. It becomes a service. Basically, service is a network accessible um, uh, interface that you can uh, you call using a specific protocol. As example, it can be HTTP or it can be a, um, a gRPC, so and so forth, that bind into some kind of a message. But the business expectation of a service is different. It's asking for a um, solution for a business problem. So when you try to provide a solution for a business problem, you need to connect these services. And that's where we came up with this uh, composite services or gateways in our architecture. So if you look at the microservices, again, no difference. Like you write a set of code and then annotate it, and it becomes a, a microservice. Based on the scope, you divide that monolith service into small services. So that's what happened with microservices and if the if you look at the business business will not care whether you are writing a monolith or whether you are writing a microservice what business was expecting again um, a set of capabilities that you expose basically some functionality as a business capability to do that you need to connect microservices when you start writing microservices it might be okay when you have 10 15 services but when you go beyond 100 um, 200 services you will end up with this pattern. So it's a common thing that you need to have composite services or uh, you need to put a gateway on top of these services to have a proper business uh, capability exposed from your uh, services. So that's the uh, kind of fundamental thing that we identify. You need to um, uh, combine set of services and expose it as a common functionality. And this combination of the services, we put a boundary and started calling that as a cell. So that was the, uh, uh, the background behind this. So Paul mentioned like why uh, we picked this thing. So it's kind of a really cool concept because everything uh, built based on sales and we thought uh, a larger enterprise also uh, similar that you have small components that uh, build uh, these uh, particular large systems. So the uh, fundamentals of this uh, con concept, basically the atomic unit of this architecture, we call it as a component. So component can be anything. It can be a database, it can be a service, it can be a microservice, it can be a function, it can be a gateway. Whatever you run in your uh, particular deployment can treat it as a component. So that is the atomic unit. And then you connect multiple components and expose the capabilities using a gateway that becomes a cell and cell contains a boundary as I explained earlier. So the, uh, uh, the cell and the component ratio in most cases it's one to many and in some cases it can be one to one. As example if you are exposing a database then it will be one to one. If you are exposing a message broker capabilities, it can be one to one. But in most cases, it's one to many that one cell contains many components. Then uh, the cells connect using this concepts called control plane, data plane, and a management plane. Uh, so I, uh, the analogy here basically in a trail uh, 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 track, basically the trail track, uh, the train track will be the control plane, train will be the data plane, and the control center will be the management plane. So this concept we used heavily in uh, cell communication as well. So each and every cell contains a local control plane and a data plane, and there's a global control plane, data plane, and a management plane as well. So if you are familiar with uh, this service mesh concept, Concept, something similar, but this is more than that. This is service mesh plus plus. So you have a local mesh and a global mesh in this 
uh, particular architecture. So then the, uh, uh, the ingress calls to the cell always come through the gateway, but if you are doing an egress call outside the cell, you can use these three patterns, uh, the sidecar, adapter and ambassador, uh, three famous patterns in microservices and uh, container world that you can use, use those three and then do a uh, external call from uh, each and every cell. But uh, beauty of this architecture, when you do an external call, it will go and hit another gateway in a, a, a specific cell. So the, uh, uh, it's an API first architecture, why I uh, tell that? Because each and every component will communicate using an API as well as cell to cell communication will happen through a API as well. But it's not only HTTP or a RESTful API, it can be a event, it can be a stream based on the capabilities and the behavior that you want to uh, expose through the API, you can decide what kind of a API that you should expose through that. Then uh, the gateway pattern in this architecture helping a lot that you can enforce policies at the gateway as well as you can um, uh, enable observability at the gateway level as well because all communication will go through some kind of a gateway. So once you enable observability or enforce policies that you can easily put uh, governance into the architecture as well as you can capture what kind of communication will happen in your uh, system as well. Then the security of a cell, again, uh, detailed topic that we need to dig in deep. But uh, in summary, a cell can uh, self-service within the cell by issuing certificates or uh, 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 tokens, or it can go and get additional information from external IDP and cache the information within the cell to make it high performance and manage uh, security in that way. So this is a detailed topic, actually we are planning to release another paper on this, but uh, both patterns are supported and self-signed tokens can be a candidate for that and uh, this is the common pattern most of the implementations are using. Then the developer experience of a cell, it doesn't change that uh, uh, you can, uh, uh, you might uh, create a new cell and start your deployment or you might uh, start with the writing services and then bring all these services into a cell. Both patterns can be uh, implemented. And uh, the developer lifecycle will not change. Developers will do their usual uh, commits, like they will develop, uh, they will test, they will commit uh, into the remote Git repo, and then uh, the uh, uh, deployment will happen. If you are in a container world, you will not deploy components, you will deploy another uh, brand new cell. But if you are in bare metal or um, uh, um, uh, non-containerized environment, you might deploy components as well. That deployment happen based on uh, the control planes, like if you deploy a component, it will call the local control plane. If you deploy a cell, it will call the global control plane and deploy your uh, deployments. Then the uh, life cycle of a cell, each cell will contain a version as well as each and every component inside the cell uh, will contain a, a version as well. That will create a lot of agility for you as well as you can do blue green or uh, canary or rainbow kind of uh, deployments. Uh, using this and that provide more agility. Now since there is a version for the components, you can have uh, agility at the component level. Since there is a version for the cell, you can have agility at that level and then you can extend it to the enterprise level. So three levels of agility that you will, you will gain that we call it as a structured agility. Then the, uh, uh, those are about individual cells, but how an enterprise will uh, look like. So basically uh, uh, it will look like this. A number of cells will run uh, internally. Those are like local to the enterprise and then you will have external cells as well, like SaaS applications and uh, your partner networks. And then there will be um, applications that end use applications running as cells as well. So we categorize these things into different types, logics based basically your services and then integration uh, cells are uh, who connects these different uh, uh, service capabilities. Then there are legacy cells that you put a gateway and then make them uh, looks new. And then uh, there are uh, like external cells, your SaaS and partner applications, data cells, identity, and then uh, the channel cells, those are the end user applications and IoT kind of things that will connect with end users. So those are the uh, cell types that we have. 
then uh, a reference implementation this is example that how it will uh, looks like so in this example you have an employee cell order cell and uh, the customer cell so that's how this organization organize uh, they are core capabilities that um, each and every uh, group will uh, expose. So based on that, they have decided uh, or designed uh, this in this way. And uh, it's a, a, a technology uh, independent uh, architecture, but if you uh, look at it at the implementation level, uh, I have used some WSO2 components as well as non-WSO2 stuff. We use Ballerina in that cell, and then this group is using Spring Boot uh, with Nginx. So what I want to highlight, based on uh, the technology that you want to use, you can map it to the architecture and use it. And another thing, uh, uh, you don't need to have a common uh, technology, uh, uh, you don't need to mandate the technology across the organization. Each and every group can pick their uh, preference and then uh, implement it. Common thing is you expose the capabilities as an API, so um, uh, that way you can uh, collaborate with each and every group. So it's a human-centric architecture because now uh, Paul explained about this uh, self-organized teams. Uh, so now self-organized teams have an architecture boundary as well. That architecture boundary can be the cell. And the rule here, one cell uh, can own by a single team. A single team can own multiple cells, but cell is not shareable. So that way, a, a team can plan, build, test, run, and manage that particular cell. So that's the beauty of this architecture. Uh, each and every team can expose a cell or multiple cells based on their uh, need. And then the, uh, the, uh, the measurement of success, because the, again, the business will not care, right, whether you are using microservices architecture or layered architecture or cell-based architecture. Uh, so uh, the, the key thing that you can show, uh, these are some KPIs that how you can um, uh, show your uh, productivity. So the layered architecture, this is the problem because the wait time is really high. Uh, you are depending on another team till you get an answer from those teams. You had to wait. But in uh, this architecture, you can improve the flow efficiency by uh, minimizing the, um, uh, the wait time. That is one KPI. And the second KPI we identify mean time to repair, that how quickly you can fix a bug and uh, release another version, or how quickly you can introduce a new feature and then release it. So these are kind of really good uh, KPIs that you can show to the business when you apply this uh, architecture pattern. So in summary, a cell basically self-contained, you can deploy it as a unit and you can independently um, uh, uh, scale it at the component level as well as at the cell level. And then it contains a local uh, data plane and a control plane. And as the architecture, it's a decentralized, compatible with the microservices architecture, as well as it's compatible with cloud native architecture. And it's technology neutral and it's human centric and that will generate like you can expose your APIs as a product to your organization by using this architecture pattern. So then the contribution from our side, uh, basically what we have done, uh, so we released these two papers uh, under this uh, Creative Commons license. So you can access it using these two um, uh, URLs. And then uh, we uh, release Ballerina and Celery as supportive products. You can use Ballerina to write components, and you can use Celery to deploy these cells in a uh, cloud native environment like Kubernetes. So those are the uh, contribution that we have done. So this is under Creative Commons, and these products uh, released under Apache 2.0. So our invitation is to consume it, as well as, as Paul mentioned, if you have any suggestions, you can send a PR uh, so we can uh, incorporate it with our um, specification. So this is just a start that we have released uh, kind of 1.0 versions and we are in the process of improving uh, these specifications as well. And we are running this as uh, more community driven specifications. Uh, so that's where your contribution can be really helpful. Um, and uh, so that's kind of an invitation to consume as well as provide feedback. And if you are happy with the content, give us a uh, git star as well. Uh, so that's how uh, these projects are working. Uh, so we are providing some consultancy around this as well to help uh, organizations. So if you are interested, uh, then you can contact us. We are happy to come and do evaluation on that uh, particular um, 
uh, the matrix that Paul showed about uh, the digital transformation maturity model, as well as uh, around the cell-based architecture, we can help you to design as well as have a proper implementation plan around that as well.